Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. We're so happy to have you all here tonight uh, with us, uh, live either through Facebook or YouTube, um, wherever you may be. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight, as many of you know, we will be talking about some of the exciting advancements in uh, early stage lung cancer. We have an all-star cast uh, with us tonight to discuss um, what's going on in that space. We've got two uh, amazing physicians here. One is uh, medical oncologist extraordinaire, Dr. Osara Gabon. Um, he is from Baptist Cancer Center in Memphis, Tennessee. And we have Dr. Jones, who is the Chief Thoracic uh, Services Department of Surgery at Memorial, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. What, what actually constitutes early stage lung cancer? We think of early stage lung cancer as typically localized uh, to the chest, to one of the lungs, uh, and only one. And we, we think of it being as more of a discrete nodule. And typically, at least by, by imaging studies like CAT scans and x-rays and PET scans, there's likely not any lymph nodes involved. And so that would be an early stage tumor, uh, relatively small, like less than three centimeters, no lymph nodes by, by analysis, and all contained in, in one area. It's not moved outside of the chest, has not spread anywhere. So I think that's what I think of when people say they have early stage lung cancer. So Dr. Jones, can you talk a little bit about the different um, types of surgeons that might perform a lung cancer surgery? Yeah, that's a great, a great question, Danielle. I think the, there are a few types of surgeons who will who, uh, operate on, on lung cancer. Um, I would say the uh, there's occasionally still some general surgeons. These are surgeons who have some experience operating on lung cancer, probably uh, are a little older and um, have not had formal training, but have some experience. And they still do a, a fair number of, of lung cancer surgeries in the United States. Then there's the cardiothoracic surgeon who, who, who also does open heart surgery. Um, but may as well, in, a, in kind of a mixed practice, also do some uh, oncology work, some lung cancer surgery. And then you have a more dedicated uh, thoracic surgeon, a thoracic surgical oncologist even, even more so, who that's all that they really do. They're very focused on that disease, uh, and they're very focused on working as a team uh, on managing that disease. And they tend to have, I think, a little, a little more um, uh, experience because that's all they do. They're not uh, also taking out a appendix if you're a general surgeon or if you're a cardiac surgeon doing uh, open heart surgery. So those are the three types of, of surgeons that tend to do lung surgery. And I would say that hospitals in general are moving towards credentialing uh, surgeons who have, who are dedicated thoracic surgeons for their oncology programs, for their cancer centers. So I, I think that, um, uh, and that's for, for reasons that are, are pretty clear. There's a, a fair amount of data that outcomes uh, are typically better uh, when you see a thoracic surgeon, and that's what they, they do most of the time. Before we get into some of the advancements, historically, how have these early stage surgical, you know, surgical patients been treated? What does that look like? I mean, can you talk a little bit about not just the surgery itself, but sometimes maybe patients have treatment uh, before, sometimes they have it after. Um, what, do, what does that look like in, in this patient set? You know, the first thing that, that any um, oncologist, whether a medical oncologist or surgical oncologist, needs to do is establish the stage of the cancer. 
And to do that, that requires typically uh, some imaging studies. I mentioned earlier, a CAT scan, a PET scan. And we have to get a tissue diagnosis. Is this really a lung cancer or is it something else? Is it a benign process, something that's mimicking a lung cancer that we need to, we would treat totally differently? And that often requires a, a biopsy uh, in order to know uh, what it is, a pathologic, uh, referred to as a pathologic diagnosis. And, and then we, you finally begin to, to put together what type stage they have. And let's say it's a an early stage cancer where it doesn't appear that it's spread to any lymph nodes and and then you really need to assess the patient you know how what's their physical uh, abilities how functional are they and could they tolerate an operation and if they can then typically surgery is the first line approach if you look at uh, you know guidelines uh, to, for which all surgeons should know about, that would be the first approach provided the patient could, could tolerate that operation. We would not generally give uh, treatment um, like chemotherapy or immunotherapy or targeted therapy for very early stage tumors because there's no proven benefit yet that that would be helpful. And in fact, at least for chemotherapy, it's, it's harmful. So we would not do that for a stage one lung cancer, for instance. Now, having said all that, the tumors are not always only two or three centimeters. Sometimes they're bigger, uh, and sometimes they have some lymph nodes that are involved, either by biopsy or by PET scan. And in those situations, they're not just early stage. These are what we call more local regionally advanced. They're a little, little bigger. They may involve lymph nodes. And these patients may, in fact, be candidates uh, to get some treatment first before you would consider an operation. And increasingly, we're making decisions about what type of treatment that person should receive before an operation uh, based on uh, information from the biopsy. And here we're talking about specific uh, aspects, features, characteristics of the tumor such as the, the tumor genes that are there. There are also how, if there are certain proteins that are expressed that may make the tumor more susceptible to immunotherapy. So we're getting more and more information from the biopsy. And those patients may get some treatment, typically that lasts maybe, you know, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, uh, and then the patient gets an operation. So, um, and we can talk more about what happens after an operation, but I think that at least gets us started on, on your question. Heretofore, surgery was commonly done in the 1980s, 1990s with a pretty large incision uh, in between the ribs, but uh, almost uniformly now, I would say 80% of thoracic surgical operations for certainly early stage lung cancer are all done minimally invasively now either with a, a video assisted or sometimes called VATS approach or robotically. And so I think that that has been a, a real benefit for early patient um, uh, recovery, less pain, um, you know, and I think it's, it's really seen in the early, early phases of recovery. After about six months, the, whether you have the big incision or the small incision, it doesn't matter so much. But getting you home and getting you back to work and getting you back to how you, uh, you want to be with your, your spouse and your family, the minimally invasive approaches, I think, have made a big difference. And I think that points directly back to what you were talking about earlier when you are talking about the skill of the surgeon, right? Because... Not just anybody can use a VATS or a Da Vinci robot or, or something like that, right? Exactly, and particularly for the more complicated procedures. Um, you know, so I think that as your experience grows with those approaches, then you realize that you can do more things, you can do them well, just as, just as well, and perhaps even better uh, than the larger incisions or the open approaches. So this patient... Um has a ground glass opacity, uh, very early stage zero. They haven't yet diagnosed it as a stage one, um, but they're worried. What does the follow-up or what should the follow-up look like in a, in a patient like that? Smoker or non-smoker? 
The reason I, I mention that is probably, at least in my practice, somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of patients who have lung cancer are, are lifelong uh, never smokers or maybe had a few cigarettes in college, something like that. And they often present with these uh, ground glass opacifications or what I call a little smudge on the CAT scan. How you treat those is typically uh, you do not take the patient right to the operating room. Uh, we really want to try to avoid over-treatment in these situations. And it's best to, here's where you really need to see someone, uh, a pulmonologist, uh, a, a thoracic surgeon who's, who's very familiar with this, who's, who works carefully with the radiologist. Sometimes these smudges can become more solid, and as they become more solid, then there is a concern about an invasive uh, lung cancer. Um, but oftentimes, these lesions can just be managed with what we call active surveillance, which just means they need serial CAT scans, careful follow-up, uh, and there's nothing that they need to do uh, emergently, including not even getting a biopsy. They just need to follow it very carefully. The, the, the reason why what David just said is very important is that um, as we are doing more CAT scans, radiologic imaging, we are finding a whole lot more people with these things. And the challenge is if we pull the trigger and everybody jumped in and flailed around, we would probably hurt more people than, than we would help. So, so it's very important um, to understand that most of the time, these GGOs, these ground glass opacities, are actually very indolent, uh, even if they're cancerous. And there is a significant, I think about a third of them actually resolves continuously, turn out not to be cancer, just a little, you know, inflammatory something that looked like a cancer for a while. But even the ones that turn out to be cancer, so long as there's some judicious oversight, um, the idea that you missed a cancer diagnosis for a little bit of time does not come back to be harmful. Therefore, we do have time to watch them until they you know, sometimes these things, they play possum. So you do have, now the Fleischner Society recommends that we actually follow these patients for at least five years. Um, because sometimes they, they play possum on you. But, but um, so long as they don't change the way David said, uh, become more dense uh, or, or get bigger uh, uh, significantly, they, it's actually safe to watch them. You mentioned Fleischner's. And if you could just explain for our audience what, what exactly that is. Yeah, the Fleischner Society is an international society of uh, people very interested in um, conditions uh, within the chest, especially the lungs. It's a society that's made up, was made up traditionally mostly of radiologists, but over x-ray specialists. But over the years, they have expanded to include, you know, mongrels like myself uh, in medical oncology. Um, there are surgeons, there are um, lots of pulmonologists in the, in the group. They, they make guidelines for things, for diseases of the chest, including, in this case, what we're talking about, how to manage lung nodules uh, in ways that are both safe and effective uh, so we don't do basically exactly goldilocks trying to make it where it's not too hot not too cold we don't sit on things that can become dangerous but we don't jump in when uh, it's something that could really be left alone when do we tell patients to get a second opinion and sometimes we have to kind of force them, you know, in that direction when we kind of see what's happening or not happening that should be happening. Um, but what are your thoughts on, on you know, decision making and multidisciplinary teams? So, so lung cancer is complex. It is very, very complex um, at multiple levels. Uh, the patients to begin with. Patients tend to be somewhat older. Um, they tend to have accumulated other comorbidities, um, you know, whether heart disease, stroke, even a previous cancer, 
Um, the, the place we're worried about the chest cavity is anatomically hard to get at, okay? It's got all these bones. It's got the heart in there. It's got these bl big blood vessels. And, and, of course, the lungs are nothing more than inflated balloons, just daring you to pop them. So, so gaining access to the thoracic cavity, it turns out, is uh, a challenge in response to which all kinds of innovations have happened. Uh, and, and each of these innovations tend to be controlled by a different type of doctor. So when, when Dr. Jones talked about getting a biopsy, for example, there are many different ways you could do a biopsy. It could be simply a radiologist using a needle. It could be a pulmonologist using a flexible tube. It could be a surgeon actually taking you to the operating room to take a piece of something. Um, staging treatments, uh, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and, and the nice thing with, with lung cancer is the challenge is getting even more complicated because our options are rapidly expanding. So it gets to be very confusing. And the truth is in human systems, no one person can honestly master this widening array of options. So what do we tend to do as humans? Well, you know, I got a hammer, so everything becomes a nail. If that's all I know, chances are I'm probably going to offer that specific service. Maybe what the patient needs may not be what the patient needs. So the idea that you have a complex, scary, and yes, indeed, still often lethal problem that is difficult to manage, and that management involves many different people, some of whom may or may not be needed in any individual patient, creates what? A need to communicate better, transparently, upfront, early among ourselves, which is really what this multidisciplinary idea is. So when the question comes, um, should I get a second opinion? My answer is, of course you should. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is a life-threatening challenge, potentially. And, and when the question comes, where can I get such a second opinion? Well, the nice thing about multidisciplinary care is that if you think about it logically, it is actually a second, third, fourth opinion. Because when you have the surgeon, when done right, you have each of these many different specialists in, in the room together around you, uh, virtually or, or in reality. You got surgeons, you got medical oncologists, you got radiologists, you've got the pathologists, you've got the pulmonologists, you've got palliative care people. So, so when one guy wanting to be over eager to do his thing, maybe seems to be getting out of line, you have all these other partners who can come and say, whoa, 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 have you thought about it from this angle? Have you thought about this? And then at the end of the day, when done right, they actually gather together and then arrive at the best evidence-based consensus for that patient with, within the limits of what the patient is willing and able to accept. So the other thing we must not forget is ultimately it's a shared decision-making thing that actively involves the patient and ideally their caregiver as well. What does multidisciplinary mean? It means maybe you should be talking to a radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist and a thoracic surgeon. And the really cool thing is, and one of the things that we've uh, realized in the pandemic is, you know, you don't need to go see all of those people uh, yourself. That can happen virtually. And it happens on emails and it happens on phone calls. And it happens when doctors are really focused together and, and are communicating, as Ray said. So I think that, uh, you know, the burden's not on the patient to go to all of these appointments. I think the burden's on the, on the doctors to make sure that they've done a good job uh, running this case up the flagpole, if you will, and making sure they've looked at all options. In this early stage setting, we touched a little bit on, or Dr. Jones, you did a little bit on determining whether or not we're gonna treat a patient, you know, pre, you know before surgery or after surgery. And some really exciting things came out um, at ASCO last year. Um, around uh, the ADORA trial. Can you talk a little bit about what that, um, 
what that is and what that means for, for patients that are diagnosed at early stage. Uh, I would just uh, echo, I think, what, uh, what, what someone said earlier in, in our conversation that, you know, 30 or 40 percent of patients who have early stage lung cancer have a recurrence. And um, one of the advances that have been made uh, is our understanding of what we call tumor genomics. And there are certain genes that if they are altered, sometimes you hear the term mutation, that, that means they're altered, um, that they uh, uh, can actually have drugs that begin to target that alteration. And those uh, tumors respond amazingly well to, to that targeted therapy. Um, and what we found uh, with a specific gene, uh, an EGFR gene, an EGFR, if that uh, gene is altered in two specific ways, uh, patients who, who have their tumor removed and that gene, again, this is the gene in the tumor, not the gene traveling, uh, not, not your own genes, this is the tumor gene, so important to know that. Uh, but if, if your tumor has that alteration and you then take a pill, uh, as well as some chemotherapy at first, but a pill ultimately, after your operation, the likelihood that you are going to have a recurrence, uh, at least in this multi-institution uh, phase three international trial, was about 87% less than those individuals who had the same alteration but didn't take that targeted pill. And also one of the challenges with lung cancer surgery is that sometimes it can recur and it can recur in the brain. And so at ESMO, which is another big medical conference in Europe, uh, the observation was made that the recurrences in the brain, which are very tricky to treat, or were also much less when you were on this medication. And so I think these are the type, this is an example uh, of the uh, advances that, 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 that Ray mentioned, all of the things that are now coming and before us all, how to treat uh, lung cancer and its many faces, uh, is that uh, there are now targeted therapies. And so it's no longer gonna be perhaps uh, surgery only. They will be possibly uh, a pill or some other therapies that add real benefit. And this is not dissimilar to what we see, for instance, in breast cancer. Uh, so I think lung cancer is moving in that direction. And it won't just be pills. There will be immunotherapy. There will be other approaches. So even for early stage lung cancer, and let's just put early in quotation marks, it's likely that it's going to require a multidisciplinary, a multi-pronged approach for us to maximize our outcomes. And so that the name of this trial that we're using as an example, as a paradigm to discuss the evolving management of early stage lung cancer was called the ADORA trial. And, um, and I think uh, Ray, Ray, Ray should comment on this because I think there'll be more of these types of trials. Yeah, David, I, th I think that's a that's a very good point. So the, um, there is a general pattern that uh, drug discovery works in. Um, when when a new uh, target is found or a new potential treatment is identified and the drugs are developed to test, typically, ethically, we would start from the most difficult end of things. Uh, patients who have pretty widespread uh, uh, condition that is uh, not regarded as curable, that have already undergone and maybe seen multiple types of treatments tried and not succeed. And then, and then those patients go into um, uh, 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 trials to develop these drugs. Now, once these drugs are proven, typically they're proven in people first, uh, second line, after f conventional first line treatment has failed. Then if the drugs are promising, we begin to ask, well, gee, um, is this drug as good, better, or worse than our so-called current standard? Now, once it passes with these um, advanced case, um, advanced stage uh, conditions, we begin to ask about bringing the drug closer and closer 
into earlier and earlier stage where we know we still, uh, in spite of our best efforts, continue to struggle uh, to, to cure everyone, which is ultimately our goal, to have lung cancer go away and never come back in everybody. So, so when we have drugs that work, that clearly work, oftentimes have been approved to be used in patient, for patients whose condition is more advanced, then we go to people who, whose condition does not look that advanced, but in whom we know we're not perfect in achieving a cure, to ask whether adding to whatever we typically do that cures some but not everybody might add a few more people onto the good side of the ledger, if you will. And that's the idea of adjuvant therapy and, and all these new uh, treatments that Dr. Jones mentioned. So, for example, we're in the age of discovery about, you know, the drivers of lung cancer. So lung cancer is no longer a monolith. It is now fragmenting into tiny little bits and pieces of different biology, different behaving cancers that are driven by different, you know, gene uh, changes and protein uh, markers that can be identified that, that then allow you to attach a specific treatment to that cancer. So the ADARA trial that David just mentioned started out with one of the most common targets, the EGFR mutation. But there is a myriad of other mutations. In fact, we now have uh, nine different uh, types of gene mutations for which there's already been either FDA approval uh, for seven of them or for two others very close to um, FDA approval in the sense that they had something called the breakthrough designation to accelerate development. Okay. Now, these other drugs which work against maybe somewhat less common uh, um, mutations, but if you added them all up, it turns out to be a big slice of a huge pizza. Um, we're in the process of testing them all. Now, the, the less common the mutation, the harder it is to do a test, but there's another mutation called the ALK mutation for which there are trials that are testing drugs that target target them. And, and you know, David mentioned um, immunotherapy earlier. So there are also adjuvant immunotherapy trials, knowing that immunotherapy has gone through that same pattern, started out with the, the most difficult end of stage four lung cancer, lost, uh, tried everything, nothing really worked anymore. Ah, these drugs work. Now let's use them in first line for stage four. Ah, works. Now let's use them for stage three that can't have surgery after chemotherapy and radiation. Ah, really works very well. Well. How about people who have surgery? Will they work? Those trials are actually still ongoing. So what uh, is this going to mean for these, these early stage patients? And, and how do you see that sort of evolving um, and getting them this type of testing? That's a great value, actually, the political, if you will, or the policy level value of a dollar. Because one of the major problems we had with recommending routine biomarker testing was, well, how do we know who to test, okay? Um, the tests typically would be done through the pathologist, but the pathologist doesn't have all the information to know if this is the right guy to test or not. So, so early on, years ago, you would have situations where somebody has had surgery for stage one lung cancer, and then the pathologist wanting to be a champ does this biomarker testing, and then it comes to the, the two of our allies, dude, why did you do that? We're not going to use it for anything. And, and then they get confused. So the idea of simplifying the process of testing is something that can get us from this confusing world of who do, how do I know who to test, therefore I'm not testing anybody, which is unfortunately still oftentimes the, 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 no, the case in many, many places, to where, well, it's almost the full spectrum now. I mean, Adara 
didn't include stage one patients deliberately because their risk for um, the earliest of stage one patients, because their risk is still uh, small enough that it'll be hard to really prove whether or not there's benefit. But but they took pretty much almost the whole spectrum of patients who undergo surgical resection. So people whose tumors were four centimeters or more, anybody who had any kind of invasion of critical structures like the chest wall and so on, people with lymph nodes involved. So these are the kinds of people, these are um, the kinds of people for which Adara established benefit. Now it makes our conversations within our healthcare infrastructure easier. We're now beginning to say, okay, it's good to do biomarker testing for patients who have stage four disease. We think it's good for patients with advanced stage three disease, okay, um, because we sometimes, we oftentimes will selectively treat some of those people the way we treat them, uh, we treat stage four. And now you have, well, even if you're going to undergo surgery, there is a role for biomarker testing. Now, now I, I have to emphasize that right now, where we are, where we are in time, in a fast-moving world, but where we are in time, is that the one biomarker outside of a clinical trial is this specific EGFR. So I can imagine insurance companies pushing back, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you want to do this 648 gene panel? when there's only one gene that we really ought to be paying for, why, why would I want to do that? But, but you can see where the science is going. The science exactly. ultimately is going to take us to a world in which biomarker testing should be done for everyone. The technology will get to where it is cheap enough that nobody's going to be carping about the cost and so on. Um, and I have no doubt that that's where we're going. And I, I think we're only a few years away. It's different now than it was 20 years ago is because we can actually do something with the information. We actually have drugs and we've done enough research, maybe not totally, to, to know that in, in treating uh, a biomarker driven uh, tumor, the outcomes are better. So I think if uh, we absolutely ultimately will be testing all patients who have, have lung cancer is, is what, I, what I think will happen. Maybe, maybe not the very early stage ones, but everyone else is going to get tested. I want to get some opinions on, uh, based on this question, on SBRT versus surgery um, for some of these early stage patients. And and just off the top of my head, I'm kind of thinking as I'm adding to this, is there a plan to maybe add um, a targeted type of therapy to maybe some type of radiation therapy in the future? Well, I can start with this. I think for, for those of you who don't know, uh, SBRT is the stereotactic uh, radiation. So it's a focused beam of radiation to the tumor and the immediate surrounding uh, lung tissue. And uh, typically it's delivered in about four to six treatments. Uh, more common. It can be a little more, but it's it's a little better tolerated. It doesn't take as long as what's called conventional radiation. Um, and, and the toxicity, if you will, to the lung is also considered uh, to be less. So um, I think most radiation oncologists and thoracic surgeons would consider SBRT, for instance, for um, uh, a patient who was not uh, particularly healthy. They may have had smoke for many years, their lungs are not very strong, and they're not a good surgery candidate. And those patients, I think, uh, would be uh, a very good candidate for the, for the SBRT. And some patients uh, also just say, you know, I'm not sure I want to get an operation, and so they would want to pursue, pursue SBRT, and I think that's totally, totally fine. Um, for those patients who have good lung function or good operative candidates, uh, have a tumor that you think you can completely remove surgically, I think the standard of care is still surgery if that's what they want to do. And I do think that just like uh, combining drugs with, um, with surgery, uh, there, were, there are trials undergoing, uh, going on right now com combining them with SBRT just as well. So we'll, 
they'll learn more. And I think even more than the targeted therapy, perhaps more the immunotherapy with the radiation, uh, I think is more likely. Yeah, in fact, we just, uh, we, we, there are several such trials. We just opened one uh, through SWOG, uh, I think in 2020, um, trying to, um, to, to take advantage of what seems to be synergy between radiation and immunotherapy. It turns out when you radiate a tumor, um, as you damage uh, the DNA and protein structure of the uh, cells, they expose things that make them yummier, if you will, to the immune system, uh, more recognizable, and uh, the immune system is a bit more readily able to attack them. And when you add immunotherapy to that milieu, it turns out it's sort of like adding, you know, you know, gasoline to a, a, a flame, it allows the immune system really charge up and, and, and take over. Uh, in fact, there are these, uh, these, uh, this thing, the fancy awkward word called an abscopal effect that people have described where people who get radiation therapy and then uh, exposed to immunotherapy, they actually have Apparently, lesions away from the place where you radiated them actually, uh, you know, respond um, uh, in ways that uh, are somewhat uh, impressive, can be impressive. So, so there's a lot of interest exploring the synergy between those two. Yes, exactly. The risk factors for lung cancer, there's the obvious, right? There's tobacco, and we hear about it all the time. Um, but t- tobacco is not the only thing. Um, that is a risk factor for, for lung cancer. There's radon, there's asbestos, there's you know in certain environmental exposures, family history, all of these things combined. So um, the way the, sc- the screening guidelines were set up previously in the United States alone, there were roughly 10 million people walking around that qualified for this vital screening um, in order to try and find these lung cancers early so that we can give them all the treatments that we've discussed in the, in the first half of um, um, of this of this conversation, looking for a curative effect. Can you talk a little bit about what the new guidelines are? And I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, popu- the, the extended population that it will benefit. And I don't know who wants to take sure. it. Well, I can start off. So, so first of all, um, the whole idea of screening has gone through multiple uh, iterations. First, you know, some promising evidence, uh, the disappointments of, you know, trying to use chest CT scans back, you know, in the 1970s, uh, three huge trials funded by the NIH all failed. And then this idea of CT screening came about uh, first, I believe, in Japan, and and then um, Claudia Henschke and her group sort of ran with it, but did it in a non-comparative way. Results were pretty exciting, but there were lots of skeptics. So the NIH uh, funded this humongous uh, trial, 60,000 individuals, one half getting a low-dose CT scan once a year, three times. That's it. Yeah, three times, and and the other is getting a chest X-ray, and and the bottom line that national lung screening trial showed that yes, indeed, screening not only saves lives by reducing your chances of dying of lung cancer, but saves lives period by reducing your dying of any cause. End of story. First time anybody's clinical trial has shown that for any screening test. I just want to emphasize that because low-dose screening CT sort of gets bad press sometimes. People want to focus on the harms and dangers and all kinds of stuff. So in order to kind of give screening every chance to show its mojo, if you will, okay, they had to bring the figure out a way to enrich for the people most likely to get lung cancer within the time that they followed them. Okay, so this idea that you had to be a certain age, 55 and above, 55 to 75, I think it was, you had to have a certain intense smoking history, what we call 30 pack years, which is one pack a day for 30 years, half a pack a day for 60 years, two packs a day for 15 years, okay? And you either had to be actively smoking or if you had quit, you could not have quit longer than 15 years ago. Otherwise, you didn't qualify for the trial. 
So basically, they were looking for what we would call in Texas the smokiness of the smoking uh, population, okay? And then they put them in that trial. And when the trial was successful, the natural conservative tendency was, okay, we know this works for these kinds of people. Therefore, these are the kinds of people that we will approve to be tested, okay? That does not mean, so, so that's where you maybe found the light bulb. Doesn't mean that that's where you lost your keys, okay? So, so the problem was using those criteria, even if we found some way to get it where 100% of people who met those criteria would go through screening, you would, we project, only find about 30% of all the lung cancers diagnosed in America every year. 70% of patients would, would not qualify. 70% of people destined to get lung cancer would not meet your eligibility criteria. We knew that. And so there was all this effort made to try to figure out a better way, and that work is still going on. Now, at the same time, the Europeans did their trial. They did multiple, but the real one was the Nelson trial, the Belgian trial, that used somewhat different criteria lower age, 50 and above, less intense smoking history, okay? And that trial came out a year or two ago and was a straight up success. Maybe even more powerful results than what we found. So grappling with this new data, the task force came up with this idea. We will lower the age from 55, the lower age from 55 to 50, we will reduce the smoking intensity required from 30 pack years to 20 pack years, okay? Now, what does that do for us? Essentially, the projections are, it actually almost doubles the number of people that will become eligible for screening. So that's the great news. Does that get us all the way? Is that the final answer? Of course not. So we still have our work Put out for us. And I'm going to pause here so David can chime in because I, I would like to add one new interesting thing that we learned from Wald Long just a few weeks ago from Taiwan. Oh, good. Okay. I want to hear that. I think you, uh, you hit all the, the, the key points. I think the other thing that uh, we've learned too in terms of specific patient populations or demographics is that women. Uh, and underrepresented minorities also get uh, lung cancer at an earlier age. And so uh, by making it 55, we were leaving out people who probably need uh, to be getting screened. And so uh, the incidence, I mean, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we are operating on more women now who have lung cancer than men by far. So I think that uh, that recognition was important and uh and to raise so that would be the one thing i may add to raise comments there are two groups of people who get lung cancer with less intense exposure to tobacco women and racial ethnic minorities especially blacks so when you set the bar at that intense 30 pack year history what you did was you you raised it too high for a lot of these folks who, who were going to get lung cancer anyway from smoking uh, um, less than what you, 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 you said was your criteria. Now, to take it all the way to the other extreme, now we know that the, the proportion of people who get lung cancer without personally having dragged on a cigarette themselves is rising. Okay, the lung cancer in so-called never smokers or people who have never smoked themselves. Some of it is secondhand smoke. I worked in a bar when it was still okay to smoke indoors. I worked in a, you know, gambling establishment where we know people still smoke, you know, things like that. The five B's of, of tobacco exposure, we call them bingo parlors, bars, you know, bowling alleys and so on. Um, but, but even then beyond that, there are lots of other reasons why people get lung cancer. Radon gas exposure is something I think people may know that when you buy a new house, sometimes the realtor offers you the, the possibility of testing for radon, uh, you know. Uh, certain types of, you know, uranium miners, people who do certain types of jobs. 
Okay. But but I'll take you to the other extreme, the talent study. Um, fascinating plenary session presentation. I can't wait to see the paper. So talent is the Taiwanese uh, lung cancer uh, screening in never smoker trial. So it's a randomized controlled trial that basically enrolled the photographic negative of what the NLST did. They wanted people who had either never smoked or if they smoked, they had quit more, than, not less, more than 15 years before. Um, they wanted people who had a family history of lung cancer and so on and so forth. So they enriched this population and then they did their clinical trial. And what did they find? They found a higher proportion of their screening population, I think 2.6% of their patients who had a CAT scan on the randomized trial actually turned out to get lung cancer. The NLST with this highly concentrated, you know, for smoking population was 1.1%, okay? Um, fascinating. So here you've essentially scrubbed off or really blown away diluted the impact of smoking, which is what we always talk about. Oh, did you smoke? You got long hair. Oh, how much do you smoke? Well, here are all those people who don't smoke, never smoke, most of them. So, so then you begin to look at their family history. Fascinating. They found that over half of the patients with lung cancer that diagnosed had uh, a strong family history, a first, second, third degree relative. And the fascinating part was the family history was not through the dad. It was your mother, brother, or sister having had lung cancer, suddenly your risk, you know, went way up. So, so what that begins to do is it begins to guide us where to look for the gene that makes that susceptibility so, which creates the opportunity to really discover something that can help a much larger, quite frankly, exactly. much larger proportion of people. And, and, and you know what that means is we have to stop trying to make it continually be smoking and look for new things like hormones, birth control. You know, why are women different than men? Because they take a lot of those things. You know, that could be one reason. You know, we're doing that epidemiology study for the young lung patients under 40. And we're go we just went in for public pub publication on our genomics of young lung and we're asking all those questions you know what's the difference be between in men and women my family four other members lost to lung cancer i'm mm. number five all my mother's mm. side so mm. there are other reasons you and you never want to say you never want to you know, you don't want people to think you're promoting smoking because we all know smoking is bad. It's the number one cause of heart disease, you know, but there's no stigma there. And, you know, we, we, um, we, we've had things that have kept us back for so long from doing good things for lung cancer patients. And that door is wide open now. That door is wide open for us to start significantly saving some lives. Can you guys talk a little bit about what IPNs, incidental pulmonary nodules, are and how, how they should be managed? <laughs> I think that it's extraordinarily common. We get CAT scans for any number of reasons, some abdominal discomfort. You go to the emergency room, we, we often joke that you, you just go right through the CAT scanner to get to the emergency room. So everyone is getting them. And incident, incidental pulmonary nodules are very common, and the majority of these nodules are benign. But in certain patients who may have some risk factors, they're a smoker, maybe they're a woman who's not a smoker but a f strong family history, as Bonnie just talked about. I mean, those nodules need to be taken with a little bit, they need to be looked at differently. And um, there are guidelines. Uh, again, Ray mentioned the Flesher Society, but this is exactly, you know, if you have an, an incidental discovered pulmonary nodule, there is a protocol that you should be put on in terms of follow-up with additional imaging, typically. Um, so 
I think that this is a very common problem. We, we get this all the time uh, in, our, in our clinics as well. Uh, the only thing that I, as I've reflected on this, is having the patient get a copy of your CAT scan report and go over it with your primary care doctor and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Just getting the CAT scan and being told by someone in the emergency room or wherever that it's okay, it's probably not, not good enough. Yeah. But there are algorithms on how to manage these, these nodules. And I'll just chime in that that's a real opportunity. So in my healthcare system, years ago when we started our multi-D program, um, where the radiologists and everybody else would be gathered in a conference room together, uh, I, I think they became quickly aghast at how many times we could trace the natural history of undiagnosed lung cancer. And I think the the moment of crisis came about when the guy who was chief of radiology saw the thing and traced it, and I was like, yeah, da, 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 da. and then he looked at the report and he, it was his report. He had dictated several years before, lesion recommended CAT scan in three months, never got done. The guy had had a heart attack. Everybody was excited about taking care of his heart attack. He survived it only to run into stage four lung cancer three, four years later. So after that, we started this effort to organize how we triage this, these uh, CT scans using technology. We use uh, our electronic health record system, have a, a micro text that the radiologist is asked to put in there that automates the collection. And then we have a team of navigators using guidelines to triage them into different risk categories. I'll tell you, fast forward, we started our screening program and this incidental long nodule program about the, the same year, uh, 2015. You fast forward 2020, for every one lung cancer we have diagnosed through screening, we have identified six patients with lung cancer. The ratio is six to one. It, it's, it's incredible. And, and you know, what is really fascinating is once again, almost 70% of the patients we diagnose with lung cancer through the nodule program 70% of them would not have been eligible for screening using the previous right. uh, criteria. Uh, so so right. a huge opportunity. And one of the things we're saying is we probably need to implement these programs uh, in, in, in tandem because there's great synergy between them. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists for this conversation tonight. I, I genuinely hope um, and fingers crossed that once this pandemic sort of runs its course and we are all, all able to get back together live, that you will come and join us uh, out here in California in the living room um, and, and do this again sometime soon. So thank you all. Have a wonderful night. And I apologize we went uh, a little late. See you next time. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see